Chapter 5, Consumer Behaviour. Consumer Behaviour, most commonly referred to as CB, is the biggest domain of marketing research. It is one of the most popular areas for academic marketers to research and publish in, and it has one of the biggest impacts on how marketing functions. And we're going to summarize it in 45 minutes. So this is another one of the subject areas where we have a full length semester course in it. And I would really encourage you, even if you're not going on to do marketing as a major, it's worth picking up CB just for a better understanding of how you function as a consumer if you don't actually want to ever be a marketer and work with consumers directly. So the first things to really appreciate about where we're at with the chapters and the progress is this is the first round of insights into the individuals that we're going to deal with. So consumer behavior forms the platform upon which we rest the marketing mix, the value propositions, the offers. It helps us understand the ways in which we will deal with people. People will interact and react to our product offer, but also the way that they will react to pricing, the way that they will interpret our advertising, and some factors that we can go and use then that are incredibly helpful for understanding our market segments. So this is a broad domain. This is a real broad brush summary, but there's also a couple of points in this chapter that will be really directly relevant to you individually. And we'll highlight those as we go along. So the first thing is understanding the consumer. Consumers, and when we look at the definition of marketing, we talked about the idea of the customer and the client. Well, the consumer basically is whoever is using the goods, services, or ideas. That means that they're not necessarily the person who buys them, not necessarily the person who makes the decision. They're the person who uses the end offer. So that makes them the clients in the definition. and may also make them the customer, but dominantly, predominantly, they are the consumer. So what you're looking at here is, again, understanding that these are the people for whom we are targeting our marketing offerings. We're aiming them at consumers. We can cluster consumers together, and consumers can form buying groups. So you can be treating consumers as aggregated to the individual level, each person is a consumer. We can be treating the consumer as aggregated to a purchasing group, a household, a family, a share flat, a purchasing club. There are whole ways in which you can be operating as individual or as collective. So what we're looking for when we're trying to understand consumer behavior is what are the impacts and what are the influences on the individual? So we're understanding that there are the internal influences of who we are as people, thoughts, memories, experiences, preferences, and then there are the external impacts, our environment, the locations in which we're buying, and the other people with whom we deal. These both feed into the decision processes and this then goes and creates a complicated scenario where we've got some control over the external influences as marketers. We have some control over the internal influences insofar as we can create experience or we can pass on knowledge, but we don't have a lot of control over that. In fact, most of the time it's referred to as the black box decision making because we know it happens, we just don't know how it happens. So decision making in this process what we mean by that is that there are going to always be choices. Now, currently you have chosen to watch this video, which means that you have triggered opportunity costs of everything else you could be doing instead of watching this video. I'd also like to point out that I've triggered opportunity costs in recording this video, and the decision I made to produce this and the decision you're making to consume it basically have some similarities. Now, the decision-making processes really in short summary version 
is we know it's a cognitive activity and we know it's an effective activity. It can be complicated and come and come with planning and detail and there's a whole lot of stuff in CB that talks about rational decision making processes or it can be a simple learned response or it can look like it's an uninformed trigger when it's actually it's a real it's a thought out process but it's just a fast process. So if you think about this from the perspective of the times that you have agonized gone over and over a really small purchase because you know you wanted something but you've just been up and down that confectionery aisle and you didn't know what you wanted and that's a complex cognitive activity because you've been weighing pros and cons against everything or it could have been a simple learned response of you walk into the store you know precisely what you want because your brand is there you always buy that it's Friday night you're on the way home you swing by a place you always go to, pick up the product you always buy, it's a learnt response. It's a... And then there's the times that you walk in, you don't quite, to your friends, it appears you don't quite know what you're doing, so I'll have one of those, grab it off the shelf. It could appear to be uninformed, but you've heard about the brand, you know about the brand, you've heard good things from mates, you'll give it a go. So again, one of the challenges we have as marketers is that we don't necessarily get to measure or observe the process that's going on internally. So we can look at someone's decision behavior and what can be a simple learned response can be moving so quickly that it looks like an uninformed choice. What can be an uninformed, looks like a learned response could actually be an uninformed choice because you just You've looked over your options, you've got no idea, so you've gone one, two, three, that'll do. And just made a random choice. Now, figure 5.1 is one of the most important diagrams. This recurs in consumer behavior theory. And this is huge. This is basically a flowchart that's attempting to describe the human experience, which is quite complicated because it's the human experience and when we look at this from the perspective of how do we use this as a marketer I think right now you're probably looking at this from the perspective of how do I deal with this for an assessment task well the good news from the assessment perspective you are looking at the limited use a model this complicated isn't going to be given to you in one of my exams. I'm not seeing this as valuable in terms of I'd like you to learn it from memory. Its value comes from I'd like you to apply it. And what I want you to apply it to is how you're dealing with the product selection for the third assignment. So if you haven't looked at the last assignment yet, you're asked to select a product. I want you to go through the product decision process here and work through each of these steps. I want you to look at it in terms of, okay, you have a problem that you recognize. You have an assignment topic you need to address. How are you going to do the selection? Internal search? Is it search? Internal? Is it external? What's the type of product you want to select? How do your beliefs, your attitude, and your intentions influence that? Do you, are you going to buy one of these products so you can have it to use? Do you already have one? It'll get a little hard to do the satisfaction and satisfaction about the selection of your product for your assessment task. But again, what we're looking at here is look at the way the loops and the wires connect. And the alternative evaluation, it connects Search gives you your options that you can choose from. The options you can choose from are influenced by what you think are important, which is influenced by your individual characteristics. What does your social group think is important? What are your situational influences? You might have a very strongly professed brand preference for Coca-Cola, but at a push, Diet Pepsi will do. Like, you prefer Coke, but you're thirsty, and that's near enough. So your situational influence will override your preference. 
So again, with this model, what I'm looking at is go through it, go through step by step, and really look at this from the perspective of what can you learn about yourself whilst you're analyzing this. How do you make decisions? Do you do a lot of internal search, a lot of external search? Where do you get that knowledge from on your external search? Is it marketer dominated? Is it non-marketer dominated? If you want to know uh, about a new product, do you go to the product's website? Or do you hit up Google and start looking for blogs? If you see a particular, say, product offer or a new game, and I speak from experience, when I see a new Facebook game or game pop up on my advertising feed on Facebook, I will quite often type in the game's name and the word scam into Google to see what comes up next. So I'm not looking for marketer-generated information there, I'm looking for customer-generated information. The other facet of this particular model that's really important is that when we come back to this, is the information processing angle also heavily impacts advertising. Exposure, attention, comprehension, acceptance and retention. But also this information processing describes what's happening to you right now. This model sitting on the screen is mere exposure. If you're not paying attention, if you're drifting off, you're looking around the monitor. You're not paying attention, so it's not fully loading. The comprehension, there's a lot of wires and diagrams in here. It's, do you completely understand it yet? Also, do you agree with it? Do you think that's how we think? Because you might be at, yeah, okay, I can see it does this, it does that. But if you're not at the point of going, yes, I accept that this is information, or you heard me say, I'm not going to put it on the, I'm not going to make you recite it in the exam, so they've gone, oh, not important, don't need that. It won't come in for retention. And the other aspect of this, so taking a step back again, one of the things I'm asking you to do with your assessment tasks this semester is I'm getting you to prepare for the exam by engaging in external search, your secondary data collections required for your assignments, so that when you are taking your notes, I'm asking you to pay attention and be involved and be engaged. We're using the exposure and attention. Attention to comprehension, I'm getting you to apply and use this information to address an assignment task. I'm getting you to use the comprehension aspect in terms of translating rather than direct quoting. I'm getting you to feel that this information is useful, that's the acceptance, with the intention then of getting it to be retained into the memory so that when you come to the exam, and you sit down and you see an exam question that triggers your problem recognition, you've got a very strongly developed internal search mechanism for marketing content. This model explains what I'm trying to do with the assessment tasks this semester. So, let's talk about a couple of the theories. I've mentioned involvement numerous times, and most of the time I've mentioned this has been in terms of getting you to keep your involvement level up so that you are really conscious and cognitive of your decision making during your assignment processes. Now, involvement is a critical component part because what it does is it keeps your brain active. If you're not engaging with your content, if you're not paying attention, you don't have a high involvement level, then you're more likely to do routine decisions. Now, involvement from a marketer's perspective is a pro and a con. On the positive side, low involvement means brand loyalty. It means less cognitive investment. It means always buying the same thing because you've always bought it, which means you're brand loyal, which means you're the perfect customer. On the other side, the problem with low involvement is that you're not going to go buy anything else. So. For me, as someone trying to take you from a competitor, I want to raise your involvement level. So I want you to be conscious of your decision. As someone who I want to retain, I want you to lower that level right back down and not think about it. High involvement is positive because people are engaged, they're thinking about it. But high involvement tends to come with a possible problem of greater levels of perceived risk. 
because you are starting to think about it in terms of pros and cons, risk versus reward, and we've got you to start actually paying attention. So you'll be weighing up decisions. So involvement as a high level or involvement as a low level, both of them have their values. Again, it's one of these things where there's no inherent good or bad. Low involvement or high involvement is neither good nor bad. It is all context specific of what is valuable to you. All right, perceived risk. This is an area that I actually did my honors thesis. So I spent a year of my life studying perceived risk. And there are three things that are important for you to understand. Number one, humans are terrible at perceived risk. We really don't understand it. If we can imagine it, even if it's unlikely, we will see it as a more realistic risk. So something that's easily recalled, easy to imagine, like if you play the Jaws theme music in an inland country town pub and ask people about their likelihood of being attacked by a shark, they will have a higher risk of shark, they will perceive themselves as being at higher risk of shark attack because they can imagine the shark attack scene from Jaws. The fact that they're an extended distance from a Sharknado is beside the point. It's the perception. The reality of the risk isn't the factor here, it's perceived. So factors that can come into play in perceived risk are things like the cost. Will, will we waste our money? Will we waste our time? Will it be something that's too hard for me to understand? What will my mates think of me? So perceived social risk is actually quite a significant facet to this in that you'll be sitting there going, I want to do something, but I'm not sure if my friends are going to approve and I don't, and the cost of my friends disapproving is more expensive than the value I'm going to get from doing this thing. So the potential social rejection is a huge part of perceived risk. And risk is also, this is one of these areas that it's worth reading around and understanding, getting on understand your own worldview. Because there's one last factor in perceived risk I want to mention, that is risk is inherent in all things. Opportunity cost is a polite statement of risk. Benefit is a risk decision. So when we go, I want, you decide, okay, I'm going to go out and buy lunch. You are basically, it is a risk. You're not fully controlling the process, so there are risks involved. But it is a low risk, a risk that's not of any substance or circumstance, because we have risk moderation, and we have risk moderating factors. However, if you were to turn down all times that you felt that there was a risk, you would actually not, you wouldn't be being safety conscious, you wouldn't be playing safe, you'd be playing at higher risk because you were constantly foregoing opportunities and you're constantly foregoing benefits. So in fact, the risk of failure would go up if you keep turning down risks. So it's one of these things, is everything's calculated. Sometimes our calculations are a little judgmental, but basically you can't turn down all risks without that in itself becoming a problem. All right, so the involvement aspects, look, this is just the sliding scale. One of the things that's really important to understand is that things that we think of as low risk, quite often can be done with low, involve, with low involvement. Things we think of as high risk can also be low involvement. People can decide, and the example on the screen is a new car is a high involvement, high risk, and you can sit there doing your calculations and carefully working out your maths. Or you can walk into a car yard, look at a car and go, I love it, I'm taking it. So it can be like that instant, or it can be heavily calculated. There's not, it's not a perfect correlation, it's not a perfect causation. All right, let's talk about one of the models briefly. I just want to raise your attention to this. You'll meet the ELM over time if you stay in marketing. Uh, it's got its critics, it's got its uh, value, but basically with this, what I want you to do is I want you to look at in the textbook, I want you to look at this from the point of view, how does this describe the way you make decisions? And how do you 
see this in terms, not just an inaccuracy, but also as a way of, can I hack the ELM to assist my studies? Can I get myself to a point that I'm using the high involvement and extended decision making early in the semester in my studies so that when I come to the exam, I'm in habitual and low involvement, so it's faster processing and quicker response times. So, bring us back down to a specific focus at this point, the decision making process. This is one of the big ones. And we're about to go through a whole series of high-end, heavy, uh, big impact models. So we're just going to give you a real light dusting over a whole series of things that are major parts of the marketing understanding of how we think. Decision-making process diagram, this one says that we move, and I'll note here it's a very linear model. We are actually believe it's uh, less linear that you can loop between the stages more frequently. But the basic model says there is a problem. I recognize that I have a problem. I will try and understand how to solve that problem. I will give myself a series of choices I can make, select from. I will make one of those choices, and then I will evaluate how happy I am with my choices. I refer like this one as the exam model, as in this is what the exam room looks like. I open the exam booklet. I see I have a choice of three questions. I recognize I have a problem. I have two of these to answer. I do the information search. I think I make my notes down beside my question. I evaluate, yeah, I can, I can do that one well, I can do that one well. Then I make my choice, I answer those two questions, and then I come out of it afterwards going, did I do the right thing? Because if you ever want to feel cognitive dissonance and really understand what cognitive dissonance feels like, it's that conversation, that sensation you have, and that conversation you're having with your mates after a multiple choice exam where everyone in the group has a different letter to the answer. It's really scary when there's six of you and there's only five letters. So this is a significant model for you to be thinking about and looking at and understanding. Again, for what I'm looking for here in the marketing for this subject in this semester is I'm looking at you being able to understand how this influences and where you would like to use it. Where would you like to, if you're being asked to segment a market or divide a market up, where do you think your marketing should come into play here? If you're going to advertise, where would that work? What would that influence in the decision process? So let's go through and deal with a couple of steps in depth. So the problem recognition, this is one of the central points of criticisms and marketing, but it's also one of our strengths. Problem exists. You have a current state, you have a desired state. Now, the fact you're studying marketing says that you have a current state, I don't know enough marketing, and a desired state, I'd like to know more marketing. So that triggered the process, and that brought you here. We can trigger and initiate the problem recognition process. This is something marketing can do. We are criticized for doing it. We are basically told that we create unnecessary desire, we create unnecessary demand. In a sense, there's a desire to our ideal state that people are trying to achieve. We can trigger it by saying our product can get you closer to your desired state. If your desired state is social significance and social prestige, then you're going to want something luxurious. You're going to want something with a brand name. You're going to want something that says, that says I'm worth it. Now, we aren't the person who decided that you were wanted to be someone who had ambitions to stature and glory. That was you. We can just show you that there's some marketing product, there's some products out there that as marketers we can show you, yeah, that's gonna be, help you get to that ideal state. All right, step two, information search. Again, from a consumer perspective, you have internal and external. From what I'm trying to teach you to do with this semester is also get you to really broaden your information search I want you being able to almost reflexively bring up in the event of, here's the thing I don't know, I'm going to go to Google, or I'm going to go look at to find out more. From a marketer's perspective, this information search is where you come to us and seek. 
you look for adverts, you look for marketing content, or you look for the consumer. And this is where things like Yelp and review sites, this is where the reviews on Amazon. Not that I think anyone's ever made a decision based on a review on iTunes. It's still, this is where you look at going, is this worth my time? I'm, I have a problem I want to solve, how am I going to solve it? Evaluations of alternatives. There is a huge amount of work that's been done on this in marketing theory, and there's a lot of stuff. You spend a couple of weeks on this in consumer behavior. Basically, it comes down to you can either have a calculated list where you like pros and cons, or you can have a set of simplified decision rules. So if you know that your customer deals with decision rules, then you want to be giving them emotive responses. You're, you want to trigger those decision rules. Evaluative customers, you want to be showing them features. You want to give them a features list. It's fast. Yeah. It's fast, it's tall, it's big, versus a heuristics will be it's good value. It's going to say something about you as a customer. So again, look at this one in the text. Give yourself a bit of time to also think about how do you approach things? How do you, what's your preferred way of evaluating alternatives? How does that map up against the theory in the text? So the product choice, there's a bunch of factors here that we play on. We see the return of country of origin effect, which we've mentioned in the international marketing, the world is flat approach, the price quality metric and the price quality quality uh, component part will come up again in the pricing chapter, and the brand loyalty. This is going to be one of the facets of the best product is the product I already use. I'm happy with my brand. I'm going to continue using my brand. So product choice comes with a lot of work that's been done on this from a research point of view but also has a set of other impacts in play. And one of those impacts in play is actually the availability of the product. Final step in the process, the post-purchase evaluation. This is a, a key part. We call it cognitive dissonance, but this is where you are basically trying to decide, did you do the right thing in your purchase? I will tell you now, if you want to experience cognitive dissonance at its finest, that is when there's two assignment topics and you have several hours left to go on deadline, the other assignment topic always looks better. Many years ago, I used to release a bonus assignment topic 48 hours out from the deadline just to trigger that in people. So, the next phase, having gone through the decision-making process, let's talk about influences on decision-making. Again, a major significant part of what we study in consumer behavior but also for this semester, there is a lot of this that we can make use of. The first thing I want to say is that the subject, the way the subject is designed with this pre-recorded lecture, is that I'm pulling some of the classic situational influences away from the subject. So we now are moving the situational influence of lectures, where you all sit in the box, to you're all at this individually, unless you're all gathering, you know, Small groups of you gathering around a TV set to watch this together to recreate the lecture feeling. And to do that really well, just always make certain there's an empty chair between you and someone else. We also have the situational factors here of time. We've now time shifted and broken the lecture component away so you can do it whenever you feel like it. So we have actually played around with this and thought about this for this semester. Now, in terms of what the influencers do, the internal influences, we have a whole series of discussions about key points of that. The social influences, you'll notice again, we're seeing things that we raised in international marketing come back here. What I want to highlight to you in the social influences aspect, culture, subculture, social class and group membership. Because I'm going to talk now for pretty much the rest of the lecture block about these component parts. The social influences can be used as a basis for marketing, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. 
So this is laying down some basic background information for you that when we come to the segmentation targeting and positioning chapter, you can use this again. You, when you see content in marketing recur, occasionally people get a little resistant. They feel like, I've already learned that. You might have, but now's the opportunity to benefit from that background knowledge. So let's take this diagram apart, look at the components, break it down and talk you through them. So what we'll do, we'll get you started, perception. Now, perception has the component elements of exposure, attention and interpretation, which I want to take you straight into, because this is critical to getting the semester to work for you. You've already had a few weeks of doing lectures online. You've already had a few weeks of various content things. Exposure, attention, interpretation is the most controllable aspect you have over your own, uh, I should say, own destiny in this course. Exposure simply is, it's there to be noticed. It's the intention and the interpretation that matters here. The extent to which you are committing focus, committing attention, committing brain power, saying, I want to do this, I want to learn this, that is a critical part. You have the capacity to manipulate that. The interpretation then basically is the meaning. This is where you're going to draw together and say, well, here is, and this is why I flag when content has occurred previously or will occur in the future, is so you can make the linkages and you can draw the parts together. It's also why I want you to start using a lot of this consumer behavior. You have experienced it as a consumer. So look at these models from both sides of, does this describe me? And if this, how would I use this to describe someone else? And how would I use this information? So this exposure attention information, you've got to be able to see it. You've got to have paid attention to it. And then you've got to have thought about it and said, well, how does, how do I understand that? All right, the next are the model parts. Motivation. This is the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It will come back and haunt you for the rest of your career. I first encountered this model in the first year of my undergraduate degree. Thought I'd never see it again, and I've seen it every semester since. So, what it's in its basic formulation, the idea of the Maslow hierarchy of needs is that there are basic needs, the physiological, that once satisfied, can you can then turn your attention to safety. Once you feel that you have your basics and you are secure, then comes the belongingness, that you have family, groups, friends, connections, society, then comes the ego, then comes the self-actualization. It's a model. It doesn't necessarily fully reflect society, life, or anything else. It is, however, a useful starting tool. That if you are selling something that fits to belongingness, the facets either side of it are ego and safety. So you can sell a coat on safety. You can sell this coat that makes you look like all your friends on belongingness, and you can sell this coat on self, on uh, stand out from the pack. So basically, you can look at manipulation around. What you really want to look at, though, here is these are facets that we can draw on for segmentation and can help us think about our core product. What is it someone needs? Do they need self-actualization? Are you buying this $3 bottle of water because you're thirsty, fine. Are you buying a $15 bottle of water because it's self-actualization and you think you're worth the extra money? It's about the, the motivation gives us a tool to work with. Okay, so moving into some of the, again, continue on the eternal paths. This is another area, learning, where I want you to look at your own activity. You are currently studying, not just this subject, other subjects. If you can look at how consumer behavior perceives learning, 
Examine that against your own learning styles. What do you prefer to do? How do you prefer to approach? Then you can make use of this. You can train yourself. So you can pick up you know, what do you need most. Do you need classical conditioning? Repetitive association. Does that help you understand your course material? Does reward drive you? The stimulus generalization, is that the uh, component part you need? Which is the learning style you need? And then facilitate your own study around, well, if I need classical conditioning, then it's going to be a lot of re repetition. If I need operant conditioning, then I'm going to need a small jar of rewards. So every page or two pages of reading the textbook and taking notes, that's a jelly bean. Do I need, uh, how do you want to operate? How do you want to make this work? And this is the thing that you can do with this marketing subject, is you can learn more about yourself, apply it on yourself. So think of it as a life hack. All right, continuing down component parts section, attitudes. Again, this is a, uh, we're hitting you hard with a lot of definitions. The attitudes are a lasting evaluation. So we actually have this separation because this is an evaluation of a person, object, or idea. It's a predisposition. So if you've got a positive attitude or a negative attitude, it's measurable, and it can be used as a point for separating a market. So you want to be looking at this again, because this is a huge amount of data we're dumping on you, and this is a huge info dump. It's going to be about the application. How would you use this? How would you make use of it? Where does it help you? All right, personality traits. Everyone has traits, and traits are a spectrum. Traits are also completely neutral insofar as having them. You've got them. They're not inherently good or bad. I've spent three years of my life studying innovation adoption theory. Being innovative is bad and good. Not being innovative is good and bad. There is no inherent worth to any of the personality traits here in any part of their spectrum. It's all about how you then, as a person, deal with it, or as a marketer, if you want to create the newest new thing, always have something new on the market, then you're going to want the innovative. But that's a lot of startup cost, and that's a lot of expensive, and that's a lot of times things can go wrong. If you want to have a consistent... You want an audience that knows what it likes and likes what it knows, then you want people low on innovativeness. You want people who are happy with it being the same as yesterday and the same again tomorrow. And that gives you consistency. So this is the aspect here. From a marketer's perspective, there are different traits here that marketers have written up and predisposed themselves towards preferring. There's a big bias towards innovativeness in marketing theory. But... That's because a lot of marketers are high on the innovativeness, and we cluster by like. Self-confidence, uh, that's one of the things, by the way, I'm trying to modify on you this semester, just by the by. If you walk out of here arrogant with a swagger, I've done my job. Social interaction, we've taken a little bit of that away with the uh, implementation of electronic lectures, but we're hoping to put a lot of that back with the Friday classes. And the need for cognition. I am assuming that since you're here at a university, you're a bit prone to liking to think about things. But again, liking to think and liking to feel are inherently equal. There's no, there's a preference. So if you've got an audience that likes its cognition, then you want to sell its instruction manuals. If you've got an audience that likes its affect and to feel, you want to sell it videos with puppies and kittens and your product. And if the idea of puppies and kittens and marketing theory just got you really thinking that would be nice, then you like both. All right, we're now getting into some of the metaphysical aspects. We've got a very, again, a lot of... The, the challenge in this chapter is that you're getting hit with a lot of foundations. It's like being thrown uh, into a box of Lego bricks, really. So the concept of self is an important facet for us as marketers because, as we noticed in the chapter on international marketing, 
the idea of the collectivist and the individualist. The notion of self in marketing is that we assume that the individual acts on their own behalf for themselves, for their own benefit. Now, even if by being self-sacrificing, we assume that that is meeting an internal goal of self-sacrifice for the benefit of someone else, when that someone else receives their benefit, you also get the benefit of knowing you did the right thing. So we do have a real uh, focus on that end. That's an ideological and philosophical focus in marketing as well, that we are very much about the individual. That's a bias. That's a thing you should be aware of. Marketing's flaw is that we see the individual self. All right, let's talk about a couple other things. Now, these are elements that came out of the aspects and the influences of the decision-making process. So I'm reminding you now that when we're talking about this, we start looking at things like the age group and the age, we've got things like the family life cycle. Now the family life cycle as a theory is a great way of approaching how do we deal with market segments on a demographic basis. Age does impact purchase behavior, but age is also a determinant of factors such as discretionary income, family life stage, likelihood of children, Let's face it, if you're selling to the 60 to 65 year olds, career points, if you're selling to 15 year olds, you're assuming it's a startup, a startup point in their life compared to a 45 year old, which you're assuming is a reboot point in their life. There are age based segmentation strategies to be had. The thing about age is that age should be very carefully considered because it's not a determinant, it can, also, it can be an influencing factor. Lifestyles and life cycles are a key facet to marketing. Psychographic segmentation is a major and significant part of what we do in deciding who to target and how to target them. So the lifestyle is a pattern and it's a recurring pattern of consumption. And it's measurable, it's observable, it clusters nicely, it leads to a bunch of stereotypes, so you have to be cautious on that front. But it does help us bring together market segments. And we also, as consumers, talk in the language of the lifestyle. When we talk about the scenes or sub, you know, when we talk about you know, the idea of a particular product lifestyle. So the gamer, the sports the skier, the snowboarder. You say snowboarder, you get an image of products, brands, where this person would be hanging out. You get these associations. So the lifestyles, you really, you want to look at this one as a useful source, but also as a marketer, you can make these things. You get in this business, you stay in this business, you get to determine lifestyles for other people. You can detect a pattern and you can enhance it and make it easier for people to live it. There was no gamer lifestyle. There was no concept of the gamer until such time as a bunch of marketers in a room went and said, well, you know what? We could sell a lifestyle here. So you the shirt, the shoes, the hat, the shorts, and the video game control to go with the Mountain Dew, the cheese. So, so we could do it, we can build it. Uh, just a quick heads up, in terms of lifestyles and values, uh, the VAL survey, look, this thing is in your text, they spend a bit of time on it, it's worth you going out and doing some self-exploration on it, and also, if you can get a copy and fill it out and find an online VAL survey to self-assess yourself on, it can be interesting for self-discovery. All right. Heading back now into the second phase, we've done the internal influences. And this is one of the things that's really important to look back here for a second, is all of what we've just discussed, perception, motivation, learning, attitudes, personality, age group, lifestyle. Well, that's all inside. That's all in your head. That's all about you. Who you are and what shapes how you see the world. What we're going to talk about briefly now is the world that's about to shape you and what you see. So we talk about situational influences, and this is the, as described here, 
how the environment shapes your choices. Now the two big ones are obviously going to be when we call up the physical world and time. So the physical environment, when you're at a shop, what does it look like, how does it feel, and the time. But time has a lot of facets to it. So dealing first with the physical environment, we're looking at this for what is the trigger? What does the environment do to our selves, our sense of self? Is it noisy? Which case, again, one of the facets here is that if you're into chaos and white noise, a crowd at the at peak hour is perfect, it's bliss. If you like your sense of self a bubble in your isolation, it's a nightmare. Arousal is the case of do I feel, hey, this is exciting, or do I feel dull? Oh, this is boring. So there are these factors, the arousal, the pleasure. There are these senses of how does the physical environment make me feel? And when services marketing, we spend a lot of time talking about manipulating the factors here to create the appropriate environment for you to consume. And we say that from the point of view of, if we build an appropriate environment for you to enjoy the service, and the service being intangible, then the environment becomes one of the cues and triggers that you use to judge the service. Because it's a bit like packaging. Now the time facet of the situational influences is really, really important. It's not just time of day, year, it's how much time do you have to make the decision? And this is why I'm really emphasizing understanding these consumer, understanding this chapter for give, how it's going to give you insight into how you function in an exam room. Because in the exam room, you know you've only got two hours. You've got one hour for the first question and you've got half an hour for the next two, each for the next two questions. So that makes a time pressure, that changes how you can decide, you can't go out for additional resources. We're really looking at this concept and really wanting you to say, well, what does the time pressure do? Also, what does time do in terms of budgeting? Can you, when you are looking at the cost of a product, look at it from the point of view of how much does it cost me in dollars? How much does it cost me in minutes? And social time, one of the social prices is time. Will buying into this be expensive in terms of the money or will it be expensive in terms of the time? And time is a very critical factor, particularly if we're trying to sell you something cheap. Sure, we can sell you the raw ingredients, but then you're going to have to spend six to nine hours preparing those raw ingredients. Is that actually cheap anymore? Has that become quite expensive? Okay. Having dealt with our situational, let's look at our social influences. So just a reminder that the social influences here, when you do this in consumer behavior, you'll see the cross wiring between internal influence, situational influence, and social influence. But for our purposes here, what we're really interested in is a brief overview of these component parts, because when we look at something like culture, again, it's really easy to see that other people have cultures and you look outside and of your own society, it's easier to see other people's cultures because they're visible. Culture is the invisible aspect that you've been soaking in for your entire life. So things like the norms and the values are always just part of your life so you don't question them. It's how we end up with social privileges. It's how we end up with a variety of social factors that we don't necessarily observe, but we do interact with. Subcultures are groups within a group. These are quite often, uh, when we look at regional or groups around lifestyle activities, those subcultures quite often are manufactured either by the culture, by the subculture itself or by an external party. And this is where there's a lot of stuff that done about in-group, out-group. Uh, there's a lot of work in CB. This is an area, by the way, where market research has a major role to play, particularly in ethnography and observation. 
So you can have a huge amount of fun as a market researcher understanding subcultures. Social class is something that is incredibly important in Australia. If it wasn't so important, we wouldn't make such a big fuss about telling everyone we don't have it. We have one of the most stratified societies in existence. And we know that because if we can tell you which is the nice suburb and which is the not nice suburb, that we have issues of north and south divide in Canberra, where there's no river divides the city. There's the good suburb with the good school and the good people and the nice shopping centers. And that's social class in a nutshell. It is where you stratify a society based on a social rank that comes from nothing. It usually comes out like money is the easiest way to create social class, but money itself doesn't necessarily buy you access to that social class, particularly when you can divide money into old money and new money. And the fact that you can have a nice suburb that's full of old money families in Australia says that we're a very classist and class driven society. So there's a lot of commonality. We see social class used as a segmentation strategy in politics on a regular basis. And we see social class used for status symbol stratification. And we're really big as marketers. If we want to sell luxury prestige products, social class is something we adhere to, support, activate, or create. It's worth a lot of money to us, so we perpetuate it. And if you think we don't have it, and we think you don't have social class, then all I'm gonna ask you is, what suburb are you from, and what suburb aren't you prepared to live in? Last, or well, heading near the end, the group memberships. This is, Group membership and opinion leadership, the last two significant facets. Everyone is part of a group. Everyone has a group, which uh, we refer to here as the reference group. Everyone has a connection. And there may be overt or covert rank orders. There are newcomers. There are people who founded the group. The group has formed around individuals. And you generally, by and large, like to have acceptance within this particular group. You like to, because they're your friends, or they're your family, or they're your crew. You are looking at this from the point of view of, you want to stay inside this. So you're not going to go undertake behaviors that radically set you apart from the group and assume that you're going to stay in the group. So group membership is a really important aspect to be considering. It's worth looking at, again, self-evaluation of your own life. But this is a major factor for marketers, is if we can sell the identity of a group, the referent identity. So it's the where the sunglasses look like this prime minister. It's the dress this way, fit into this group. But we can also sell group rebellion. Coca-Cola sells you the summer of love. Everyone's all friends. We're all group buddy together. And Sprite sells you individuality, lonership. It's the same company. It's the Coca-Cola Amatil company selling you group membership and group XR. So we have that in mind. I also like to point out the group membership is going to come into its own when we start talking about product and product benefits. Opinion leadership. This is the last of the elements that I want you to really self-analyze on. Who do you lead? Who comes to you seeking advice? Who follows your footstep? Who endorses it? When you say, hey, this is good, who else copies it? When you go, this is a great new band, who buys the album? So basically what you're looking at here is the opinion leadership is just a natural part of society in terms of there's usually someone who you seek out for their opinions and someone who seeks you out for your opinions. And basically, it's about the perception of expertise. Opinion leaders, and this is something I'm gonna find, and I'm gonna ask you to, again, self-observe during the process of the Friday afternoon seminars, have people emerged as natural opinion leaders? Have people 
emerged as the go-to former group, former group, someone everyone's clustering around because they want to you know, hear what that person's got to say. The thing about the opinion leadership, again, it's a good segmentation position. Its real strength comes in when we talk about product innovation theory up in the product chapter. The last point I'm going to say is gender roles are rubbish. I've spent 15 years of my career researching. I have found three, three statistically significant differences between gender over 15 years of quantitative research. Gender roles are rubbish. They are something we perpetuate because they are lazy myths that lazy marketers pursue. There is no reason for us to continue down this path apart from laziness. So they're rubbish. They've never been useful for me. I've never had a hypothesis on gender hold up worth it, anything in my professional career. And frankly, there are one or two gendered products, but they are biological elements of the same ilk and nature that you would expect a left-handed glove and a right-handed glove to be separate components, but they have no, it doesn't make a left-handed or right-handed any different. So don't bother about the gender roles, they're rubbish and a waste of time. All right, that wraps CB up. This is one of your biggest chapters and one of your biggest lectures that you're gonna have to deal with because it's just a huge domain. At the annual Australian New Zealand Marketing Academy conference, the consumer behaviour track quite often constitutes half of the papers submitted to the conference. It has before now run to, uh, over a three day period, had to run two parallel tracks, meaning that it's had six days of conference when every other stream got three. So. Basically, this is huge. There's a full subject on it. You can spend a lifetime working in it. It's one of the most fun areas to research. You learn a lot about yourself. As always, if you need me, hit me up on Twitter, at Stephen Dan, or connect across on the email, stephen.dan at anu.edu.au, or get in touch across one of the methods on the screen in front of you.